It's most probably the first large-scale international industrial war. So we have the groundwork laid in the Russo-Japanese War in 1904 and 1905. You have the use of barbed wire, um, you have the use of machine guns, uh, the use and interception of telecommunications, including wireless communications. I'm not sure if the British military actually learnt lessons from that war. Perhaps at the beginning of the war, the British military didn't necessarily realise the importance of scientists and the contribution they could make to the war efforts. And it wasn't really until sort of about 1915 that they started to realise that scientists should perhaps be held back from frontline service and indeed that unless they had some kind of core central management and a concentrated effort, they just weren't going to be able to win the war. The First World War is quite commonly referred to as the Chemists' War. Um, I would argue it's the Chemists and Engineers' War, but um, chemistry did very much come to the fore. So most of what they were developing were either um, uh, poisonous gases for use in warfare or explosives. One side moves and the other side responds. So while the Germans were the first to use poison gas, um, the British very quickly responded in twofold. Firstly, they started developing their own chemical weapons, but uh, secondly, they also started to develop countermeasures. So the first initial countermeasures were particularly crude. Uh, soldiers would pee on a handkerchief um, and put that to their nose and face, and that was a very, very, very rough uh, antidote. So um, an Oxford physiologist, that's a medical researcher here, John Scott Haldane, uh, was sent to the Western Front by Lord Kitchener to investigate what gas was being used, and he identified it as chlorine gas pretty rapidly, um, and how this might be countermeasured. So he developed uh, the first practical gas mask, which was being used on the Western Front by late 1915 and early 1916. So he was an expert on ether gases, but apparently he tested on himself, um, and he also tested on his young son, who survived and went on to become a chemist himself. The First World War is very much the birth of signals intelligence, or SIGINT as it's sometimes called. We have the establishment of Room 40 in the Admiralty, which is essentially a centre for uh, intercepted messages and for decrypting and for code breaking. They were able to intercept um, the Zimmermann telegram, which is quite well known, which was Germany essentially offering that if, if Mexico goes to war with the US, um, we will give you back Arizona, Texas and New Mexico after the war. Um, it was intercepted by the British on supposedly neutral uh, cables which went through London and it was really the Zimmerman telegram which uh, led to the US entry into World War I and that's the result of work done by the British Admiralty codebreakers in London. So most of the codebreakers were classicists and it's not really until the Second World War when you start to get mathematicians and scientists working code breaking but the information that they're receiving is a result of scientific research um, and technological developments that exist during the war and I think that is where you start to see the changing role of science science in society, science in industry, science in military. So you start to see that maybe that, that complex division between pure and applied science starts to lean more towards applied science and starts to lean more towards a complex and perhaps not entirely ethical relationship between science and industry and military needs. A lot of the people who'd worked on the weapons didn't necessarily perhaps have a chance to reflect um, upon what they had done until after the war. Uh, Fritz Haber, known as the father of chemical weapons and chemical warfare, didn't seem to have any concerns himself personally. Um, his wife, who was um, also a scientific researcher, killed herself a month after um, he'd first witnessed and supervised um, the introduction of chlorine gas on the Western Front at the Second Battle of Ypres. Um, he died in the 1930s and so he didn't actually go on to live to see most of his extended Jewish family being killed by the gases that his research institute had developed during and after the First World War. It's probably very much uh, the end of the Edwardian age and the birthplace of maybe not literally the 20th century and of the modern age most. Obviously the military industrial complex uh, concerns about security and privacy in terms of um, communications and ethical concerns about scientists uh, working for the military or with the military and working in industry.